So you remember from a couple weeks ago and from Lynn's story uh, with the kids that Jacob is quite the deceiver. He has swindled his brother out of his birthright and through deception he stole his brother's blessing and Esau was understandably angry with Jacob. Angry enough to be a threat to Jacob's life. And so Jacob fled his homeland. He left his father and his mother and the inheritance that he had worked so very hard to steal. And the story in Genesis continues following Jacob's life in chapters 28 to 31. He makes a life for himself in the employ of his uncle Laban. And Jacob finds out in these chapters what it is like to be deceived as Laban swindles Jacob into years of labor while promising him a wife only to give him the wrong daughter. The swindler becomes the swindled. About 20 years go by in which Jacob grows his family, grows his wealth, and we read in Genesis 31 verse 3 that one day God says to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives, and I will be with you. With that command from God, go back, as well as the promise, I will be with you, Jacob gathers up his whole household and begins the journey back to his homeland, which is a journey back to his brother Esau. As Jacob prepares to meet his brother, he has an unexpected encounter with God. After this life-changing encounter with God, Jacob is ready to return home and meet his brother. Would you join me in prayer as we enter into the text this morning? Holy Spirit, soften our hearts to hear what you would have for us this day. Where there might be resistance to your work in our lives, help us to surrender Meet us, even as you met Jacob thousands of years ago, that we might be blessed by you. In the name of Jesus, the word made flesh. Amen. The passage read for us by Don this morning contains two components that are important for addressing problems we face in life. Jacob's problem is that God has called him to return home, but he knows that his brother has 20 years of resentment and anger and thoughts of taking revenge waiting for him. So Jacob does the two things you can do with any problem like this, and it's important that he does them both. He plans and he prays. His plan is to send messengers ahead of time to give Jacob a heads up. He doesn't want to surprise, or excuse me, give Esau a heads up. Jacob does not want to surprise Esau by just showing up. And Jacob gives the messengers very clear wording. He says, tell Esau three things. First, tell him I've been staying with our uncle Laban all this time. Second, tell him I have cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, male and female servants. And third, tell him I am sending this message so that I might find favor in his eyes. The whole message is a message of hope for reconciliation. If we break it down into these three things, we see this. First, Jacob has been staying with Laban this whole time. This is his way of telling Esau, hey, I haven't been hiding out. I haven't been living up in the hills, sneaking around, trying to get back uh, to take that inheritance I left. Jacob wants Esau to know that he has given Esau space And he's not been attempting to take the inheritance that he was given. And second, Jacob tells Esau that he's got cattle, donkeys, servants, etc., which means he can care for himself. He says, I'm not coming back to mooch off of you, brother Esau. I'm not coming to take from our father. I can be self-sufficient. And third, and most importantly, he tells Esau that he's sending this message in order to find favor with Esau. This is Jacob's way of saying, I want to reconcile with you. I want to move home and I want to let our past be water under the bridge. Let's let bygones be bygones. Jacob's plan is to seek reconciliation with with his brother, which he knows he needs in order to live in the land peacefully. 
And the text tells us that the messengers, they deliver the message and they return to Jacob with a message from Esau. Actually, it's not a message. It's just a statement of what Esau is doing. They say, we delivered your message. Esau is coming and he has 400 men with us, with him. This is the part where the kids would say, dum, 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 dum. If this was a television drama, this is where they would end the season. What's going to happen? Is Esau coming to kill Jacob? He's bringing 400 men. That can really only mean he's ready to fight Jacob, right? It seems that way. Fortunately, this story keeps right on going. We don't have a cliffhanger. The message that comes to him that 400 men are coming causes Jacob to rightfully fear the worst. And so he goes into planning mode once again. He splits his camp into two, so if Esau attacks one camp, the other can escape. Remember, Jacob has shown himself to be a shrewd operator over and over again. He uses that shrewdness now to try and save not only himself, but his family as well. Jacob made a plan. When we face a problem, when we face conflict that needs addressing, it is good to plan. But that isn't all that Jacob does. He plans, he makes his best plan, but he also prays. He prays that God will save him. Jacob, the one who manipulates situations to his own ends, is out of options. He could lose at least half of his camp if Esau attacks. His back is against the wall, and he is desperate for some assistance. And so he does what a lot of us do in those situations. He prays. In verses 32, 11, he says, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. When facing conflict, we may feel as though we have a binary choice. We can plan or we can pray. We can take action or we can ask God for help. It's tempting to plan and rely on our own ingenuity, our own wisdom, our own understanding, and not ask for God's intervention. We might think our winsome personality will overcome messy interpersonal dynamics. Jacob plans. He does his best with what he's got. But scripture is clear that we are to ask God for his help in all things. We're to bring our prayers to him so that he can be like a good parent who gives good gifts. God wants us to pray and bring him into the problems we are facing. Proverbs 16, 9 in the message says it like this, we plan the way we want to live, but only God can make us able to live it. We can plan, but all our plans depend on God for their success or not. So then we could say that the lesson then is to simply pray and let God take care of all of our problems. That would be the option to pray and not plan. But God wants us, he wants us to pray, but he also wants us to use the wisdom, insight, and discernment he has given us to work out what needs to be done. Again, from Proverbs, this time Proverbs 21, verse 5, says that the plans of the diligent lead to profit as haste leads to poverty. It isn't enough for Christians to pray for conflict to end and not actually engage in peacemaking. We cannot be people who sit on the sidelines quietly praying for an end to political polarization, family dysfunction, or even global conflict. God has given us gifts, abilities, knowledge, resources to plan a way forward. When faced with a conflict bigger than we can manage, we are to be people who both plan and pray for God to intervene. Commentator Tremper Longman put it this way, we should avoid the presumption of prayer without action or the arrogance of action without prayer. I'll read that again. We should avoid the presumption of prayer without action or the arrogance of action without prayer. We're to be people who plan and pray to do one without the other would be unwise. In the prayer, Jacob prays he says in desperation to God, save me. 
Save me, God, from what looks like my brother coming to kill me and my household. Save me from this retribution, even if I do deserve it. Save me, he prays. And this is the first time we see Jacob going and asking God for help. He's out of ideas. His plans are in motion, but he doesn't know what will happen. He knows he needs saving, so he asks the one who has promised to be with him to help him with this conflict. The morning after Jacob prays, he strengthens his plans a bit more. He sends gifts ahead to his brother Esau. He sends goats and sheep and rams and camels and cows and bulls. He spaces them out and tells his servants when they meet Esau to tell him that they are gifts from his servant Jacob. Jacob is throwing everything he can at Esau to reconcile this conflict. He's giving up everything he can spare to keep his brother on his side. Everything at his disposal, his strength, everything he can do to fix this relationship. He's desperate, and he uses his strategic power to fix it. Remember that Jacob, Jacob's name means supplanter or grasper. His entire identity is built on the fact that he is self-reliant. He does whatever he must to get what he wants. But here he can do nothing. He can't do any more. He's done everything he can. He's planned and he's prayed and the scoundrel is out of options. He hopes that the gifts will pacify. That's what the text says, that they will pacify his brother. After doing all he can, after sending all the gifts ahead, after praying, he spends one last night alone. And here we come to one of the most intriguing appearances of the divine in all of scripture. Jacob wrestles with a man who is a manifestation of God himself. Biblical scholars call this kind of appearance in scripture a theophany. A theophany is a visible manifestation of God to humans. Think of the burning bush uh, of God appearing and speaking to Moses. This is similar. This theophany, this appearance of God, occurs at a specific location, the ford of the Jabbok. This stream or river is the border of the land of his father. When Jacob, 20 years ago, left, he left alone, and the text tells us that Jacob sent his wives and children and all his household ahead of him so that he would have this one last night alone outside the land of his father. Alone he left, and alone he will return, but because of this night he will return a different person. Because Jacob has an encounter with God, and it is an extraordinary encounter unlike anything we read elsewhere in Scripture. And it goes like this. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans. And have overcome. Before Jacob can meet Esau, before this conflict can be resolved between these two brothers, Jacob has an encounter with God. And it's an encounter that leaves him changed forever. There's some wordplay going on in the Hebrew, and if you've been listening to me preach, for very long. You know I love a little nerding out on uh, the Bible and and wordplay in in scripture. So here we go. Jacob is said Yabuk, Yaakov, sorry. The Yab, the Jabuk is the Yabuk, and wrestled is Yibek. So it sounds all very similar. It can be read like this, Yaakov, Yibek's on the banks of the Yabok. There's this wordplay going on, and I think it points to the fact that Jacob is self-reliant. The place sounds like his name. The very action taking place sounds like his name. It literally and figuratively revolves around Jacob. The author is pointing us to the fact that everything up until this point has been all about Jacob. Jacob, Jacob, 
Jacob, but here is where Jacob comes to the end of himself. He finally reaches a point in which he surrenders to the God who desires to make a different character of Jacob. So much so that he leaves this place with a different name. The Jacob who grasps, who swindles, who cheats must die in order that a new person may live. It's an extraordinary story. Jacob and the man, they wrestle all night long. Somehow, Jacob, who is actually about 90 years old at this point, is able to wrestle a divine being all night. That's how stubborn Jacob is. That's how much he strives. He's unwilling to let go of the man. And due to his age, I think this is far less about physical wrestling. That's going on. But this is far more about a spiritual wrestling match. Jacob says that the that this man he wrestled all night is God, and God could certainly overpower Jacob physically. He proves it when he simply touches his hip and it's wrenched out of the socket. So what's going on here? How is Jacob, an old man, able to hold on to God and not let him go? How can that be? Well, as you might have guessed, this isn't a normal wrestling match. This isn't a story of God overpowering Jacob by force because this story tells us that God does not force us to change. Jacob needs to change. He needs to trust God. He needs to admit his manipulation and lies have caused Esau harm. He needs to cease being self-reliant and become God-reliant, but God will not force his will on Jacob. God will not force his will on on us. God has long desired for Jacob to turn to him. He's long hoped for a moment when Jacob would realize he cannot rely solely on his own plans, his own schemes, but would come to trust God. And God does not force Jacob to change. He could have beaten Jacob in the wrestling match, but this story tells us that that is not how God, when he gives up the match, when he surrenders his will to the Lord, then something marvelous happens. It's no ordinary wrestling match. Jacob wrestles all night and the text tells us that in the morning he holds on to God and he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob recognizes that God is stronger, that he's not able to overpower God. He recognizes the power that this wrestling partner has and he submits himself In asking for a blessing, this is the moment Jacob concedes to God. This is the moment he dies to himself, that he gives up his old ways of grasping. He knows he's not powerful enough. He knows he can't win this match. And it's at that point that Jacob asks to be blessed. The man, he asks, asks, Jacob asks the man to bless him, and then the man asks for his name, Jacob. Jacob is who I am. I'm the supplanter. I'm the grasper. I'm the one who manipulates and lies. The self-reliant person is who I am. Jacob has to admit who he is to God. He must confess it. And we then read this. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name will no longer be self-reliant, manipulator, grasper, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. In this moment of surrender, a transformation takes place. Jacob is named Israel. Jacob, the self-reliant, becomes Israel, the God wrestler. Israel means a few different things. It means wrestles with God. It means struggles with God. It means perseveres with God. Not on his own, not self-reliant, but with God. This is the character of Jacob now, one who perseveres, who struggles, who allows God to have his way in him, even when it requires Jacob to die to himself. What's curious about this statement is that God says that Jacob has wrestled and has overcome. But he doesn't seem to have overcome. At best, this is a draw. 
But God is not talking about here who won the physical wrestling match. What he is talking about is that Jacob, having allowed God to overcome his self-reliance, that is how he has won. God has changed Jacob into Israel, and that has led Jacob to overcome this character issue that needed to be overcome. Jacob wins by losing. He overcomes by submitting. This is what Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 25. He says, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This is the upside-down way of God. If Jacob had defeated God there by the Jabbok, he would have remained Jacob. He would have stubbornly refused to surrender his self-reliance and he would have maintained his identity as Jacob, but he would have missed out on the identity God had for him. Only in losing, only in surrendering does Jacob win. Only in losing our lives for Christ's sake do we find abundant life in Christ. When we die to self, as Jacob does here, only then do we find that God forms in us what we cannot form in ourselves. After this sleepless night of tumultuous wrestling that leaves Jacob wounded and renamed, he's ready to go meet Esau. Before Jacob can properly be reconciled to his brother, he needs to undergo this character transformation. And God has done that in Jacob. So he proceeds to meet his brother as he nears. The text tells us that Jacob bows to the ground seven times as he draws closer to Esau. This is the moment of truth. Will they reconcile or will things go a different way? Genesis 33, 4, Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around him, his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. The relief Jacob must feel is overwhelming. They weep at their reunion. It is one of reconciliation and not retribution. I don't think we get this reconciliation moment without God addressing Jacob's worst character flaw. The structure of this passage tells us that yes, Jacob planned and prayed, but that wasn't enough. God also had to prepare Jacob. It was in Jacob submitting to God that Jacob became someone who could participate in reconciliation. We need to read about this transformation of character before we come to the reconciliation of the brothers because there's no reconciliation without a transformation of who Jacob is. Esau was coming with 400 men. He may very well have been intent on killing Jacob. It's my personal opinion that he was. I don't think we get this reconciliation without the wrestling that comes the night before. I don't think Jacob is capable of bowing seven times to his brother if God not, had not already dealt with his self-reliance the night before. Something about that transformation that Jacob undergoes tells Esau that this is not the same person who stole his birthright. This is a person who is not relying on himself but is relying on God and is now throwing himself at Esau's mercy. Notice what did not happen the night before these two brothers reunite. Jacob did not spend the night praying that God would change Esau. He spent the night being changed. Jacob did not stay up all night praying that Esau would forgive him. He spent the night struggling to let go of his own flaws Jacob did not sit around rehashing the events of 20 years ago with his wives and servants to bolster his own version of events. He spent the night being transformed for the future. Jacob wrestled with God who dealt with his character flaws in order that he was ready for reconciliation. One commentator wrote this, God can resolve the conflict that is the result of character flaws. Sometimes our response to conflict is a prayer that God will work on the other person to produce harmony. Perhaps we need to be more willing to pray that God will change us 
take away our bitterness, overcome our habits, help us step back from our expectations, and weaken our pride. I've read in the last year or so that estrangement among family members is on the rise. By some estimates, 25% of the people in the United States are estranged from someone in their family. There are a lot of reasons given for why this is the case. Political polarization, culture wars, tensions that blew up in the pandemic. We are a society that is hyper-individualistic and we really don't need our family the way we used to to get by in the world. We're quick to be offended and not so quick to look at our own offenses. I know there are people in this congregation who are dealing with estrangement. I am experiencing estrangement in my immediate family. So I know it would be easy to hear this sermon and say, yeah, my brother or my sister, my kid or my parent, they need to smarten up and let God change them. It is much harder to say, deal with me. Take away my bitterness, overcome my habits, help me to step back from my expectations, weaken my pride. We want to think we are Esau, innocent victims who will forgive if that person will just come groveling back to us. And maybe you are mostly innocent. Maybe you don't even know why someone is so upset with you. But I know how it easy it is to feel like you are the wronged party and then harbor bitterness. To come with 400 reasons why that person doesn't deserve your forgiveness. All of that messy, messy stuff has got to come before God who is able to change us. If we do not submit ourselves to God for his work in us, how can we hope that the person we have conflict with will do that? And maybe it isn't a family member. Maybe it isn't full-on estrangement. Maybe you have conflict with a friend or colleague or someone in this church. Regardless of the relationship, we have to submit to God in order to have any hope of reconciliation. And I don't think we grasp just how important human relationships are to God. Yes, we understand that there's this relationship that we have with God um, and that he wants us to be kind to each other, but God is deeply invested in our relationships with one another. 1 John 4 says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister who they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And yet he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Their actual brother and sister and their Christian brother and sister. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that if you go to the temple to make a sacrifice and remember that someone has something against you, you need to go and make it right with that person before coming before God. In Matthew 18, there's a whole process laid out for reconciliation. And John sa Jesus says in John that the world will know you are my disciples if you love one another. God is deeply concerned about our relationships with one another. And God is capable of transforming us into people who are capable of reconciliation when we let him have his way in us. Let's close in prayer. As we sit in silence for a moment, I invite you to simply ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants you to see right now. Is there a character trait that you need to surrender to God? Is he putting a person's name on your mind that you maybe need to seek reconciliation with?